the end of this academic year after serving Bethany since 1990. Dr. Bales came to Bethany as a one-year adjunct professor of philosophy. He is retiring from the second highest position at Bethany. One of Dr. Bales' largest contributions to Bethany was the focus he provided to student retention. In 1998, he helped to restructure Bethany Seminar, and he has most recently led Bethany's initiative in the first year experience in the Foundations of Excellence project. Dr. Bales has been recognized for exceptional scholarship, having presented at the University of Puget Sound and Harvard University. His book, A Ready Reference to Philosophy East and West, is available at Amazon.com. But in his introduction, I thought I would really explain what is a provost and dean of the college. Many wonder, what is a provost and dean of the college? Well, let me explain, try, attempt to explain the important role this position plays in the life of a college. If you Google provost, you'll learn the position is an administrative officer in any of various colleges and universities who holds high rank. At Bethany, specifically, our provost is concerned with all matters that touch the student experience. Curriculum, faculty, student life, athletics, and spirituality. But what does the provost really do? Here's the inside scoop. The faculty's role is to think for the college. The president's role is to speak for the college. The provost's role is to keep the faculty from speaking and the president from thinking. <laughs> Gene has performed his duties well. Another duty is to help in the transition to your successor. In fact, I overheard Gene's advice to his successor last month. His advice was incredibly insightful and philosophical. In the real world, it's dog eat dog. At Bethany, it's just the reverse. <laughs> While outsiders may not fully grasp Provost and Dean of the College, there is someone at Bethany who does. I recently noticed a sign over the hand dryers in one of the campus restrooms. Push here for message from the provost. <laughs> when I invited Gene to be today's commencement speaker, I told him he would get the last word, or nearly so. It is my high honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Bates. <laughs>
Acknowledging that you don't know anything can be a gateway to advancement in the real world. For example, when I applied for the position of dean, I admitted that I didn't know anything about the job, and they still gave it to me anyway. At the end of nine years of being a dean, I can now say that I am just beginning to understand what's involved. But my time has run out. I am fully prepared for the next stage in life, which is understanding the meaning of the rest of my life and cutting the grass on the weekends. You're in that stage too. You graduates have reached the stage of accumulated not knowing and are prepared for the slings and arrows of fortune. You will do well because you are just beginning to understand what you need to know. The medieval thinker once called this learned ignorance. This situation in life of having an education but not knowing a whole lot is why hope is necessary. We need to have hope because we don't know what we need to know only that we don't know it. The virtue of hope implies two kinds of awareness. As St. Augustine says, hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. Your education should make you angry in some measure, because you have begun to understand the world better, and because you don't understand it as well as you thought you did. The anger is moral in nature. We are angry at things that should not be, things that are unjust, evil, unfair. While we know the things that make us angry, we don't yet know exactly how to react to such anger. That's why courage is so important. We need courage to face a future that will address our anger, a future we may not yet understand. Hope stands between partial knowledge and partial ignorance, between experienced evil and longed for goodness. Everyone who graduates must have hope, must have both anger at the way things are and courage to face the world of the future. Now faced with this philosophical analysis, I will be brave and offer some important advice to all of you. This is a requirement of all commencement addresses. Such advice usually masks the bias of the speaker. You can take any of what follows as seriously as you want, but remember, if you claim to agree with what I know, you will get only lemonade and cookies. <laughs> Number one, avoid one-dimensional mindlessness. One-dimensional mindlessness is thinking that run, runs along the same tracks, the same ruts without interruption or questioning. Paris Hilton once famously said, I don't really think, I just walk. <laughs> Many people don't really think. They just do what they've always done because they've always done it. And others go further. They think what they've always thought, and they will brook no argument against it no matter what. It's one thing to have a mindless habit. It's another to be a mindless ideologue. When people espouse ideologies, they've given up thinking. Ideological thinking is antithetical to education. And part of the purpose of a liberal arts education is to root out this kind of one-dimensional mindlessness. The worst ideologues always come off as angry. And beyond that, as fearful. They are angry about the world and fearful of the future. So what they don't have is any hope. What replaces hope in the mind of the ideologue is certainty of belief. One of the habits of an educated person that helps to manage or avoid one-dimensional mindlessness is reading. Good reading 
is not poring over numbers in an Excel spreadsheet. It is not breezing through a five-minute news summary or the celebrity news online. Good reading is reading far and wide on many subjects. Bad reading is reading only things that confirm and repeat my personal opinion and never provoke me to question it. Creative and critical thinking require good reading. I'm not necessarily referring just to serious books. Read novels, read magazines and journals, just read. When I was a child, each year, my siblings and I and every other child in our block were invited to the home of an elderly lady down the street. Everyone got a book to read. She expected nothing in return. She simply wanted each of us to read. I have never forgotten that. Another habit of an educated person who has learned, who has uh, developed learned ignorance is to never confuse information with communication. Do not assume that postings on Facebook make good friends. Social media have reshaped our lives, but they are never ever a substitute for person-to-person -person communication. We are all threatened with the temptation that written electronic messages are substitutes for our personal presence and effective communication. They aren't. We can only have courage in the face of the future if we can communicate with one another directly. If your social life is entirely about Facebook postings, you are in danger of one-dimensional mindlessness. Avoid despair and existential grumblings. Granted, we often do not understand why things are as they are, and we are often angry with them. But sometimes, if we don't face the future, we can take on the mantle of perpetual grumpiness. Grumpiness and courage are antithetical. Courage does not demand that we always smile about everything. In fact, just the opposite. You can have courage for the future if you are angry about the way things are. Despair and grumpiness can be worn well by certain kinds of people, existentialists and late romantic German composers, for example. But for most of the rest of us, living between anger and courage, between understanding and ignorance, that is the best we can do. There are three briefer bits of advice I have, each of which is a product of courage. Number one, find a job to make money, then a job you enjoy doing, and then a job that really makes a difference to others. Do it well. Love your colleagues. I have come to love my colleagues, though even I have to admit that some of them are a few cards short of a full deck. <laughs> But I really will miss my colleagues, as I know you graduates who miss your friends and teachers. This loss is part of life, and it reminds each of us how important we are to one another. Number two, keep in contact with your friends, with your teachers. They are anxious to know how you will be doing. The college is anxious to know how you will be doing. Our goal is your success. If you keep your success hidden under a bushel basket, we are left wondering what happened. Number three, think about coming back to Bethany to visit or even to work. Many of the folks who work here now graduated from here. We rely on the dedication and commitment of graduates to support the work of this college. We need you. Dear old Bethany, need you. Today is a day, day to rejoice and give thanks. To rejoice in the achievement of each of you. To give thanks for all the support and work that you have given to one another, that others, including your parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles have given, that your friends have given. 
When a person graduates from college, he or she never graduates alone. It is always with a network of supporters and friends and family. I wish each and every one of you graduating seniors my best for your 